So uh, what do I do here when it says, uh, I'm saying, I'm clicking on the screen share button. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen or not. It didn't ask me for uh, windows. Can I share a window or do I have to share my full screen? Uh, you can share the window, man. Okay, so when I click on uh, this share screen button. Ah, okay. Okay, one second. Can you see my can you see my screen now? Yes, yes ma'am, you can see. You can see the title and uh, some images. images? Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. And, and and can you? you uh, I'm running uh, the cursor, cursor on the screen. Are you able to see that? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Um, I really uh, apologize, apologize for the delay. delay. Um, thank, thank you very, very much, much uh, to SCDS uh, for this opportunity. Uh, this is uh, the second time I'm uh, talking at an SCDS event. I enjoyed the first one very much at uh, 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 Shastra University. Uh, so it's a pleasure to come back and uh, share some thoughts with you. Uh, so today uh, I will try to narrate a story uh, of the discovery of black holes. Uh, so to start with, um, what are black holes? very fancy. Um, so uh, one very simple intuitive way of uh, uh, getting our heads around the fact that space and time are very interlinked uh, is to think about uh, a description. So if I say that I am at the southwest edge of Bengaluru, uh, that is a description of where I am, but that's not a complete description because I have to say I'm at the southwest corner of Bengaluru city now. Uh, because I wasn't here yesterday, maybe, and I will not be here next week. Uh, so in that sense, you know, space and time are uh, both needed and interlinked. Uh, and, and of course, the idea is more complicated than that. But for the moment, you know, that is uh, a sufficient intuitive idea. So black holes are chunks of space. Time, which is, you can think of it as the space from which even light cannot escape. Now, uh, one can use the idea, I just said escape, so one can use the idea of escape velocity uh, to get an intuitive feel for a black hole. So we, uh, most of us, I guess, know that uh, there is something called the escape velocity, which is the speed that you need to escape from the gravitational force of any body. So for example, the escape velocity at the Earth's surface for the Earth is about 11 kilometers a second, and the escape velocity at the Moon's surface uh, is about two kilometers a second. Now, uh, if you uh, chuck something uh, very slow, uh, it will follow this right arrow and plop right to the ground. A bit faster will make it move further, but still, will it will still plop back to the ground. But if you exceed the speed of 11 kilometers, then you can launch yourself off uh, into space. Now, uh, we may all remember this. Uh, uh, this equation or formula for the escape velocity uh, from our high school physics, and uh, it relates uh, the square of the escape velocity to the, the mass of the object from which we are trying to escape, and the distance. So it is uh, this distance between the center uh, of that mass and the point from which we are trying to escape. Uh, now, um, uh, 
So as you can see here, uh, the escape velocity formula has the distance in the denominator. So if that decreases, it means that the escape velocity increases. So suppose we imagine that we squeeze the Earth into a size that is much smaller. So keep the same mass of the Earth, but squeeze it in size. So then what will happen? This, uh, this R will actually reduce, and therefore the escape velocity will increase. So in other words, if you keep the same mass and squeeze something, uh, it's the escape velocity needed to uh, escape from, it, from its surface. Now, suppose you make this velocity equal to the velocity of light itself. Now, we all know that light has a velocity of about 300,000 kilometers a second. So suppose we substitute for V the velocity of light, which typically uh, has a symbol C. What happened then? So then you will get a relationship between this R, which is the distance from the center of the mass to where you're trying to escape from, and the mass of the object. So in other words, if you have something of a given mass, which is smaller in size than is described by this formula, then the escape velocity is the velocity of light. In other words, even light cannot escape. Now, it turns out that if we want that to happen to the Earth, we have to squeeze all the mass of the Earth into a size of about a marble. So just imagine all that mass squeezed into the size of a marble. Now, it turns out that this idea uh, of something trapping even light, given that light speed is so high, uh, was a very old idea. There is uh, there's a clergyman scholar called John Mitchell who wrote about this in 1783. There's also Pierre Simon Laplace uh, who wrote about this. And so this is indeed a very old idea. Now, suppose we leave that for the moment and look at the famous general theory of relativity that Einstein proposed. Very soon after he proposed his theory, Carl Schwarzschild found a solution to Einstein's general relativity equation and came up with the same answer that we got earlier by making the escape velocity of, an, of a body equal to the velocity of light. Now that's intriguing. So was that a black hole? Because it's an object that will trap everything, including light. So if we look at Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, it was a very different way of thinking about gravity. Rather than our gravitational force, he thought of it very differently. And the way he thought about it can be summarized by the statements that John Wheeler used, which is that mass tells space-time how to curve, or you can think of it as the space, if space-time sounds uh, too nasty. And space tells mass how to move. So this was Einstein's very, very revolutionary uh, way of thinking about gravity. So in other words, uh, if you think of a sort of flat, um, we can think of a flat two-dimensional uh, space to start with, uh, and that is flat the way we understand flatness, and you put a mass in there. Then that flatness will change, and around the mass of that object, the space will curve. This is what Einstein's theory of relativity uh, says. So that is what John Wheeler meant by saying mass tells space-time how to curve. Now, that is the essential difference between um, the older ideas of gravity and the new general relativity theory. And what this, this means, this has a very important consequence. And that is that in ordinary uh, in our everyday life, we think of light as traveling in straight lines. Now, what are these straight lines? That they are the shortest possible uh, path between two points, because we think of our everyday space as flat. However, uh, since in Einstein's uh, framework, uh, space-time is not flat, 
but it could curve depending on whether or not there is a mass there. What that means is that if there is a mass, then in the closed area around that mass, space time is curved, which is uh, sort of represented by this uh, pink graph here. And therefore, light will no longer travel in straight lines, but it will travel in curved lines because the shortest distance between any two points is now curved. Right? So, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts the bending of light. So uh, one thing to note is that when when we say mass tells space time how to curve, it means any mass. So your mass, my laptop's mass, the mass of a tree, whatever. So any mass will curve space time. But we don't notice it in our everyday life because that curvature is extremely, extremely small. So now Einstein's theory predicted the bending of light, but it was a very small bending that was predicted. And so Arthur Eddington sought to test it out uh, in a very important experiment, an opportunity that was afforded by the solar eclipse of 1919. And in that eclipse, because the sun was obscured, the stars close to the sun became visible. And the positions of these stars were known um, when the sun was not there. And now when the sun came close to them, uh, close to them in the sky, that is not, not physically close to them, close to them in the sky, then Einstein's theory predicted that the light from the star would bend like this. In other words, there would be a shift in the position, and that's what our theory can measure. And this was a very, very strong uh, confirmation and uh, uh, confirmation of the general theory of relativity. Uh, and there have been many, many tests since then of the uh, general theory of relativity. For example, uh, our GPS system uh, can only work if general relativity is taken into account. I will not dwell on that. Uh, but let me go back to the formula that Carl Schwarzschild found. Um, uh, when he solved Einstein's uh, general relativity equations. So does this formula tell us that uh, there is a minimum mass? It does not. It, does, it just gives a relationship between the size and the mass. So are there objects like this that trap light, namely black holes, which are seen in the laboratory? Not so far. So, so far, there's no evidence that there are black holes in the laboratory. There have been speculations about micro-sized black holes or electron-sized black holes and so on, but they have not been found yet. And so the only black holes we know of are cosmic. And in fact, when John Mitchell and uh, Pierre Simon Laplace considered these objects that would trap light, and they call them dark stars, uh, they realized that, for example, in order to make an Earth-sized object into uh, such, a, such a dark object, you would have to squeeze all the Earth's mass into the size of a marble, and that would be impossible densities. And therefore, they realized that the only objects with plausible densities that would have this property of trapping light would be cosmic, star-like objects. So now, Einstein proposed his theory, and then it was tested, uh, first of all, with the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, which I won't talk about, but um, uh, you can easily read up about it. Uh, it was tested by Eddington confirming the bending of light, but despite all these, Despite all these uh, uh, evidence in, in favor of the general theory of relativity, the solution that Carl Schwarzschild found for this uh, curved space time around the spherically symmetric non rotating mass, uh, which indeed had the same formula that you would arrive at if you set the escape velocity to the velocity of light in the classical theory, uh, was still viewed with a lot of suspicion. And the reason was that it was a so-called singularity, meaning that things became infinity and uh, the laws that we uh, have faith in would not work. 
So when that happens, when a singularity happens, physicists are extremely suspicious. So despite the fact that general theory had all these confirmations, the Schwarzschild solution, so-called, which predicted this singularity, which was described by this formula, was not seen as a physical description. So the years went along. And people did investigate collapse of very massive objects. In particular, Subramanian Chandrasekhar discovered that if stars had, so if stars had low mass, like lower than the mass of our sun, then the so-called electron degeneracy pressure, which comes about because quantum mechanics predicts that two electrons cannot uh, cannot occupy the same energy state. So there is a certain pressure because you cannot squeeze these electrons too close to each other because of that quantum mechanical effect, which is referred to as degeneracy pressure. So because of that, stars which spend their fuel if they are of masses below the roughly the mass of our sun, then they could be held up by this pressure, this quantum mechanical pressure. However, if stars uh, have mass beyond that, then when they spend their fuel, Chandra Shekhar unstoppably collapse. He didn't say collapse to what? He made the statement, one is left with speculating on other possibilities. But... Uh, Oh, yes. So before I go further, I just want to have a small digression. So in my talk, uh, I will use, I might use units of both luminosity and mass. And for both of these, astrophysicists tend to use the mass of the sun and the luminosity of the sun as units. So that is what I might use, and I will call it solar mass and solar luminosity. And they are typically represented by these symbols, which uh, M, sun, and L. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Ma'am, sorry yeah. for interrupting. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the presentation screen is minimized, ma'am. Uh, can it be maximized? Uh, Ah, so that's what I asked you earlier, whether I can... Does it help now? Is it looking bigger now? Ah, yes, ma'am. It's looking fine now. Is it better? Ah, yes, ma'am. It's fine now. Okay. So do you want me to show any of the earlier slides where was anything not clear? Uh, no, ma'am, everything was clear, ma'am. Uh, oh. We could continue the talk. Yes, ma'am, can you show the previous slide, please? Uh, solar luminosity. <clears throat> ah, okay. Yeah. Is that good? Anything yes, else? No, okay, anything else you want? Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chandrasekhar made that prediction. Then later on, uh, uh, Oppenheimer and Volkov predicted objects called neutron stars, where they were more massive uh, than the about a solar mass. And so maybe the electron uh, quantum mechanical pressure could not hold them up when their fuel was spent, but the pressure from a similar pressure from the neutron stars could hold them up. Uh, it's another story uh, that such stars were actually discovered um, by Jocelyn Bell uh, in 1967, and that science got the Nobel Prize, although she didn't get the Nobel Prize, but that science got the Nobel Prize. And then Oppenheimer, so then now I'm coming back to the 30s. Uh, so Oppenheimer and Volkov predicted these things called neutron stars, and then Oppenheimer and Schneider investigated the collapse of even more massive objects. And they did that in the general relativity framework, and they found that these stars collapse to, indeed, the Schwarzschild singularity that Schwarzschild had proposed earlier, the same formula. Now, they correctly interpreted uh, this radius or this surface as the as an information horizon, they saying that a star at collapse will close itself off 
from any communication with a distant observer who will only sense its gravitational field. In other words, what they were saying was that if you have a very, very massive star and its fuel was all spent, then uh, it would collapse gravitationally and general theory of relativity would predict that it would collapse to what is known as a singularity, which, but that, that uh, surface, that static surface, which was described by the formula that I showed earlier, was a surface from which information from the inside could not come out. Although the gravitational effect of all that mass would indeed be felt outside of that surface. So um, now, even though they were able to show this, the many questions that people had about these singularities still continued because people still didn't like the idea of a singularity because the laws of physics essentially break down there. So a singularity basically means that there is something lacking, something, uh, there is a gap in the physical description of uh, the uh, object at hand. So there were many questions about this Schwarzschild uh, surface and uh, questions like, could they be real? They are probably not real. Uh, was it just an artifact of the symmetry that was used in the calculations? Would the matter eventually come out if there was some disturbance with that symmetry? Uh, could uh, quantum physical effects prevent that kind of a collapse into a singularity? So there were all these questions of the day. Until in about the early 60s, uh, there was the discovery of uh, objects that were called quasars. Now, uh, quasar stands for quasi stellar. So uh, these were objects that looked like stars, as you can see from this image. So uh, many of you probably are amateur astronomers and know that uh, stars produce these uh, cross-shaped uh, images. Uh, the cross is, of course, an artifact. And uh, so these objects looked exactly like stars on images, uh, like point sources, uh, in effect. But their spectra look very different from the spectra of stars. So the spectra of stars typically showed black body, uh, black body continua, and then the typical absorption lines that you see, like the front of the lines that we see from our sun. But these objects, uh, showed emission lines instead, and very luminous emission lines as well. And in the beginning, they were quite uh, puzzling, as this little poem by George Gamow uh, uh, expresses. Uh, but then um, an astrophysicist called Martin Schmidt made a correct interpretation. He realized that all the emission lines that were seen, uh, the, the emission lines that people thought were unknown lines, were actually very, very familiar lines of hydrogen and, and, and so on. But they were redshifted. That, that is, they were shifted to lower frequencies uh, to an extent that had not been seen before. So by then, the idea of the expanding universe was in place. And so if these shifts were interpreted as due to the stretching of space, the expansion of the universe, it meant that these objects were very, very far away. And if they were so far away, then it meant that the fact that we can see them so brightly meant that they were very, very luminous objects. So then how does one produce that kind of luminosity? Because... Stars cannot produce that. I mean, it meant the luminosities of billion stars. And how do you produce that kind of luminosity from such a point source? But it was a bit worse than that. The, it was worse than that because these objects, these quasar uh, things, were seen to change. That is, they, their brightness seemed to change. And it seemed to change on time scales of months or even weeks. Now, that means something very, very significant uh, by, um, by what we call the light travel time argument. And I'll just explain what that is. It's a very simple argument, but it tells us something very, very profound. So uh, if you can imagine an object uh, that is shining, and uh, I have shown time along the horizontal axis. So as you go from left to right, time is going along, increasing. 
Now, suppose you uh, see this object uh, that is shining, and then this object uh, suddenly brightens at this time. So, in other words, if you were sitting in the object, you would see a sudden brightening, instantaneous brightening, let us say, hypothetically. But for somebody observing this from a distance, the photon, so when you say object, you should think of a very large object, like something like uh, much larger than our sun, for example. So, uh, if this instantaneous brightening happens, the photon from the front surface, of this object, which is shown by this little wiggly arrow, would reach the observer first. And the photons from the back side of the object would reach the observer last. Because light takes a finite amount of time to cross distances, and so the photons from here would not be seen at the same time as the photons from there. And that gap would be uh, uh, so this, depending on how big this gap is or the size is, the, the the sort of time gap between the photon on the front and the photon on the back would be larger. So in other words, if you see an object change with some time scale, then that object has to be smaller than the amount of time light as the, the amount of distance light travels in that same time. In other words, if an object uh, is seen to change in its brightness over, say, two weeks, then its size has to be smaller than the velocity of light into two weeks. So that would be two light weeks. So the size needs to be smaller than that. So this is called a light travel time argument. It's a very simple argument. But it tells us very profound. In other words, by actually measuring changes in brightness, we are able to get a sense of uh, the size. So we can use the temporal dimension to uh, investigate the spatial dimension. So this is a very powerful argument. And these quasars are seen to vary on time scales of weeks, which meant that <coughs> they are that enormous power that we already saw came from a very, very small volume. So, so then, uh, one really needed the kind of objects that Oppenheimer and Schneider had talked about, even though they seemed very unphysical and people were very skeptical. So near the horizon that Oppenheimer and Schneider talked about, one could harness gravity to produce the power that appeared to originate from these objects. And these ideas were put forth by Saul Peter and independently by Zeldovich and Navico, um, where they said that matter that uh, can swirl around in the neighborhood of these massive objects uh, could generate the kind of luminosity that we see. So, but the question still remained about the singularity, but motivated by the fact that there were these real quasars which actually needed something like these very, very massive objects which were consistent with the Schwarzschild prediction, uh, Roger Penrose set out investigating them, and he found the answer. So uh, this is the figure that Roger Penrose drew in his paper in 1965. Uh, and his genius lay, so he was trained, he was actually trained as a mathematician. So it's uh, sometimes uh, mathematicians think of Roger Penrose as a physicist, but physicists apparently think of him as more of a mathematician. He was trained in geometry. Uh, and so he had a very intuitive uh, geometric uh, way of uh, visualizing things. And he applied very complex but very rigorous topological methods, which he innovated himself, and space-time visualizations. And this is his visualization in that paper uh, to come up, come to the conclusion that 
actually the Schwarzschild solution was an inevitable consequence of gravitational collapse. So it was not an artifact. It was not dependent on some very special assumptions of spherical symmetry and so forth, but it was an inevitable, uh, inevitable consequence. So uh, I will just briefly explain this. This diagram is just outstanding and it's just uh, fantastic to just stare at it and uh, get some of the intuition uh, that Penrose propounded. Mm, so uh, the plot here is a little different from what one might normally plot. So normally we plot things that move. We plot uh, the distance on the x-axis, uh, sorry, the time on the x-axis and distance on the y-axis. But in this case, this is what is called a space-time diagram. Uh, it, the, the, the upward axis is time and the space axis is x and y. So normal space has three dimensions. In this diagram, you kind of suppress one of those uh, dimensions just so that you are able to visualize and have time as a third dimension. And so here, what he is showing is this spherical thing, which represents a star. So it would normally be a sphere, but when you suppress one of the dimensions, it collapses into a circle. So here is the star. And as it collapses, it as time goes along, it collapses. So uh, its uh, circumference becomes smaller and smaller, which is what is shown here. And time is going uh, in the upper direction. And as it collapses, it reaches this limit called the Schwarzschild radius. And when it does that, uh, we get no information out of it anymore. Only the gravitational force is felt. Uh, I could explain it in more detail, but I don't want to uh, spend too much of time just on this. Uh, there, but it's worth uh, looking at that paper. It's, it's fairly uh, nicely explained uh, in the paper. So uh, the collapse uh, of a singularity is inevitable, is what... Uh, Roger Penrose uh, showed. Now, I want to make another digression before I move on uh, about false color images, uh, because I will be showing a lot of false color images. So I just want to clarify what they are. So here is a picture of a cat, which is just a regular picture of a cat. And here is an infrared picture of a cat. Now, the human eye cannot see infrared. So what does it mean to say this is a infrared picture of a cat, right? So uh, what it means is that one uses colors to represent the brightness that one measures in these frequencies. It could be visual frequencies, it could be uh, non-visual frequencies like radio or infrared or X-ray, but uh, one uses colors to represent the intensity. So when I say this is an infrared picture of a cat, it means that the colors are not real, they are false, and each color represents a different intensity. So in this case, the lowest uh, temperature, which would be the lowest infrared emission is white, and the highest temperature, of, which would be the highest infrared emission is yellow. This is also an infrared picture of a cat, and it's sort of similar, except that a different set of colors have been used to represent uh, the different infrared intensities, and therefore, in this case, the different temperatures. And so that shows you that the colors used are arbitrary. And so this kind of a false color picture makes sense only if you accompany it by a key. And uh, this is, again, the same image but with a different rendering and therefore a different key. Uh, so these, for example, are true color pictures of galaxies uh, in the sky, meaning to say that they have been uh, rendered in a way that the human eye would see if the human eye could see these galaxies. And here is the planet Uranus, the same picture shown twice on the left, is a so-called true color picture, that is the way the human eye would see, and on the right is a false color picture where colors have been used to depict the intensity. So that's what is what I mean by false color pictures. I will be showing a lot of them. So I talked about these objects called quasars, which were extremely luminous, so luminous that stars could not explain their luminosity, plus they changed uh, in their brightness and therefore the light 
uh, had to originate from a very, very small volume. So all this power being generated from a very small volume, the only possible explanation was this Schwarzschild singularity that uh, in the 60s started to be known as a black hole. Uh, John Wheeler is a person who popularized uh, that phrase for these entities, which were the result of inevitable massive gravitational collapse. Now, more and more investigations of quasars, especially at other frequencies, showed that not only were they extremely luminous, but from the, from such objects, there emerged these jets of plasma, which went out into well beyond the host galaxy into intergalactic space. So these are false color pictures. And here what you see on the top left is an, a visible light picture. Uh, so you see this galaxy, this elliptical galaxy in the center, galaxy of stars, and then you see various galaxies all over. Here is a foreground star with that cross-shaped artifact. And on top of this is overlaid a radio image, a false color radio image. So the uh, visible light image is a true color one, and the radio image is a false color one. And that shows you these jets of plasma, because these plasma, uh, the plasma uh, it has embedded magnetic fields and so emits synchrotron emission, which is most easily seen in the, at radio frequencies. And so this image shows you uh, these jets. And you can see that this is the extent of the star stellar distribution. So this is the extent of the galaxy. But uh, these jets of plasma are moving way beyond into the galactic space. This is another example. And here, the visible light picture is a false color picture in blue, where you see various galaxies all over and this one central galaxy and the red and yellow etc is a false color picture in radio and there you can see these jets this jet of plasma emerge and to some extent you see the other one as well but clearly they emerge all the way out in symmetric bipolar form and into intergalactic space uh, how do we know that these jets are coming out and it's not something that is from outside coming in? Because there are actual monitoring images which have seen the plasma uh, actually move. So uh, the, uh, this image is another uh, such galaxy. It is only the radio image which is shown. There is no visible light image. Um, oops. Uh, this is actually an animation, and I'm trying to uh, play it. Ah. Uh, so can you see... Uh, why is the animation not showing? Can you see the animation? No, man. Okay, uh, that's something to do with Microsoft Teams, because normally uh, the animation plays. Okay, um, so I'll just, uh, rather than interrupt my presentation, I'll just uh, tell you, that, and you can go, out, go and look this up uh, on the internet, because the animation is available on the internet. So basically, uh, what you see here is, again, uh, 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 the image uh, at radio frequencies, which shows the plasma. And the blobs of plasma, when you, if the animation would work properly, you would have seen that these blobs of plasma actually move outward. So that's how we know that these jets uh, move outward. So this, uh, this situation where you saw these fantastic phenomena, like overwhelming luminosities, uh, coming from extremely small volumes, and then these bipolar projects of plasma, which were moving uh, launched out into intergalactic space, the only possible explanation was that there had to be uh, at least a million solar mass black hole in the center of these galaxies. And I call it the Sherlock Holmes argument because what uh, the Sherlock Holmes argument says is that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So a giant black hole of a million solar masses uh, was not very uh, uh, probable, uh, but yet, because that was the only thing that remained, it had to be the truth. So in other words, this was, so far, 
circumstantial evidence for the existence of black holes, and indeed giant black holes. So now let me go back to the Milky Way. And um, so the Milky, the milkiness of the Milky Way uh, was first uh, discovered by uh, Galileo Galilei as due to billion stars. Uh, and as you probably know, um, Galileo Galilei made many discoveries, uh, landmark discoveries like the planets of Jupiter and phases of Venus and so on, and the reason for the milkiness of the Milky Way. Uh, one important thing I want to remember about Galileo is that he believed that science is for everyone. And so he, it was very common for him to take the telescope, his telescope to the marketplace and uh, show things that he had discovered uh, to just every, to members of the public. And he wrote his texts in Italian rather than Latin uh, in order to make them accessible uh, to everyone and not just to scholars who knew Latin. And indeed, the International Year of Astronomy uh, in 2009 explored uh, this idea because it celebrated 400 years of uh, Galileo's discoveries and it explored the idea, uh, the, the role of the scientific method in our daily lives and Galileo Galilei is uh, seen as the father in a sense of the scientific method. So I would say that we, for example, you, uh, space enthusiasts, we are scientists, uh, we, should, we should not only just be about scientific achievements and so showcasing scientific achievements. But we also need to be about having scientific thinking ourselves as a way of life and transforming our spheres of influence to make scientific thinking a way of life. And uh, Jawaharlal Nehru summed it up uh, really very well when he said, talked about the scientific method or scientific temper, as he called it, as a search for truth and new knowledge the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial, the capacity to change previous conclusions in the face of new evidence, and the reliance on observed fact and not on preconceived theory. So just with that little bit of digression, back to the Milky Way, which Galileo Galilei showed us was due to many, many stars, uh, which revealed themselves when he pointed his telescope at the Milky Way. Now, this is an artist concept of the Milky Way. We would never see this view because we are inside the Milky Way. Uh, but it shows what the Milky Way would look like from the outside. And the solar system um, is roughly 26,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way. Now, uh, on the sky, the center of the Milky Way is near this constellation Sagittarius. This is uh, a picture of the Milky Way, and you can see the milkiness and the dark patches. Uh, and this yellow circle is what uh, is the position of the actual center of the Milky Way. Now, why am I coming to the center of the Milky Way? I already said that there was, by now, circumstantial evidence that there was a massive black hole in the center of these galaxies, which were seen to produce enormous luminosity and the bipolar synchrotron emitting jets. Now, uh, that sort of suggested that in the center of every galaxy, there may be a giant black hole. Now, what one wanted was direct evidence for this black hole. If one wants direct evidence, one needs dynamical evidence. One needs to see the movement of objects in the very close vicinity from which one can then derive the mass of the central object that is driving the others by gravity. How do you search for such dynamical evidence? In the objects that I showed earlier, the objects are so bright that there is no chance to see any movement of objects within the very small volume. Also, these objects were extremely far away, and so we don't have sharpness of images to see uh, any such, to, to, to get any such dynamical evidence. But what about the Milky Way, and the center of the Milky Way? Did it have a giant black hole? So this is what uh, some people sought to investigate. Now, uh, there are, uh, so that is the center position of the Milky Way, just outside the spout of the constellation Sagittarius. But there are several challenges to uh, studying the center of the Milky Way. First of all, there is a lot of dust 
in our line of sight. And so you see these dark patches, which are not because there are no stars there, but because there's a lot of dust in the line of sight, and so that those that those dust particles scatter away the visible light and mm, obscure the starlight from behind. So we don't see uh, we see them as dark patches. So that is one challenge. Second challenge is that in order to uh, investigate dynamical evidence for a possible black hole in the center of the Milky Way, you need really, really sharp images. Even though the Milky center of Milky Way is only 26,000 light years away, the sharpness of images uh, at that time were not simply sufficient. Part of the reason is atmospheric turbulence. So the atmosphere retracts starlight in a varying fashion because the turbulence results in changes of refractive index in the atmosphere. And therefore, a single star, which should have been just a little point on our detector, instead dances around and produces an image like this. And because this happens very fast, what one, was, what one effectively gets is a blur and an image that is this large, rather instead of getting just a point image. So this is called seeing, and uh, or it is referred to as twinkling of stars. But it is a real challenge to getting sharp images of anything in the sky, particularly the center of the Milky Way. So around the late 70s, early 80s, infrared technology began to mature. And so infrared de detectors came to be used on telescopes. And so, for example, John Lacey and his collaborators, Charles Stams and James Hollenbach, uh, showed in a paper published in the early 80s, 1982, uh, they studied the center of the Milky Way, and they showed that gas clouds in the center of the Milky Way were moving extremely fast. And if one took it as pure dynamical evidence, then it implied a, a, a black hole of several million solar masses at the center of the galaxy. But however, they were looking at gas clouds. Now, gas clouds can be driven by gravity, but they can also be, also be driven by other sources. So this was not, um, this was tantalizing, but not confirmatory. Then with more, uh, with better technology, Reinhard Genzel, uh, Andreas Eckhart and Reinhard Genzel studied the center and they studied stars and they looked at the proper motions as they're called. Proper motion means the movement of stars in the plane of the sky as against the movement of stars in our line of sight. Uh, so for movement of stars in the line of sight, you need uh, spectra and measure Doppler shifts, whereas for movement in the plane of the sky, you need to measure positions and how they move with time. And so with uh, by measuring actual positions of stars in the infrared, uh, they did say that there is a massive black hole, but they did not actually come with a confirmation. Um, uh, so the, the, this is the statement they actually made in the paper. The dark mass is either a compact cluster of 10 to 20 solar mass black holes or a single massive black hole. So there was still some uh, ambiguity in their results. Then the Keck telescope was built. So this is a telescope on uh, Mauna Kea, which is in Hawaii, which, which has extremely an extremely stable atmosphere. And this telescope has a very, very big mirror, a 10 meter big mirror. And so Andrea Gess, who just joined uh, UCLA at that time, harnessed the Keck telescope to, to image the center of the Milky Way. Now, the trick that she used was something called speckle interferometry or speckle imaging. What that means is that you make your detections so fast, that is you make your exposures so short that effectively you're taking an exposure each time the star image dances around in, in the plane, in the focal plane. So that way you overcome this uh, uh, distortion that the turbulence of the atmosphere is causing. Now, uh, you can do that, but you can take very, very, very short exposures only if you have a very, very sensitive detector and a lot of collecting area to collect a lot of photons. Because otherwise, the short exposures, we won't see anything. And so by using this very large mirror, uh, Andrea Gaze was able to 
detect stars in the center of the Milky Way, a huge number of stars, and then uh, keep imaging them at different intervals of time in order to see how they moved. Uh, now that is the center of the Milky Way, and these are her very first images that she published. So on the left, uh, you can see these bunches of points. Each of them is due to a star. And you can see that the star is still a little bit dancing around. So instead of showing you a simple point uh, image, it is showing, yeah. Hello? Yes? Uh, was somebody trying to tell me something? Uh, am I, okay, uh, am I audible and all that? Everything okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Everything is fine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, each of these bunches of points is actually due to a star. And you can see that it's still dancing around. It's producing quite a messy uh, image. But because they were not, because they could do this very, very fast shot exposure imaging, they could actually correct for these distortions and produce this image on the right. So you can see this correspondence um, uh, between, for example, this uh, bunch of points in uh, on the left and uh, the very uh, sharp circles on the right. And as a result, uh, by observing these stars between 1995 and 1997, Andrea Yez was able to measure actual shift in the sky. So these, the, these, uh, each of these is a star, and the different symbols represent the images at different times. And you can see that the stars have shifted. So it's here shifted from here to here, here from here to here, and so forth. So, in other words they had found dynamical evidence and they, ca they calculated what is the mass that must be driving these high velocities and they came to the conclusion that it has to be three million times the mass of our sun. And therefore they actually used the phrase, our galaxy harbors a three million solar mass black hole. Now, uh, the, I said that the Keck telescope uh, had a mirror which was 10 meter diameter this mirror is actually segmented. In other words, it's made of these uh, hexagonal segments, which I've shown in blue. And therefore, each of these segments can be manipulated uh, in its orientation just a little bit. Um, and that uh, ability has been used to actually correct for the distortions that the atmosphere, co atmosphere causes. So this was the next step in technology from speckle imaging. It is called adaptive optics. And what is done is uh, a very bright star in the field or an artificial star created by a laser beam is used uh, and its image obtained to measure the distortions that the atmosphere is causing and immediately in real time connect, correct all these segments, that is distort the segments to compensate for the distortions in the atmosphere. And so this has to be done extremely fast, and uh, uh, but it's a very, very successful technique now. And this shows uh, the uh, planet Uranus and its rings, and on the left, is an image taken without, just with the Keck telescope and without this technique of correcting for the and compensating for the atmospheric distortion and the right is an image taken with that compensation and you can see the improvement. Uh, and now this is the same thing for the center of the Milky Way. So those same four stars that I showed you earlier are shown here and the image on the left is with this technique of compensation turned off. And the image on the right is with the compensation turned on. So uh, what you can see is that you see all the stars that are seen here, uh, you see on the right as well, but you see many more stars. So when, in other words, when you increase the sharpness, it not only is the position of each star made more precise, but you also see many more stars because there is less blurring of the fainter stars and so therefore you see many more stars. So that's adoptive optics. 
and Keck segmented mirrors uh, allowed it. So this this image shows this uh, hexagonal, a single hexagonal he segment, and each of them has a control which enables this uh, correction to be done. And so this now shows the result that Andrea Gez and her collaborators got. And by the way, simultaneously, Reinhard Genzel and his team were using the telescopes in Chile to do a very, very similar thing. So uh, I will describe this image a little bit because I will then show an animation uh, which uh, is the full dynamical data. So what is shown here is a false color picture in the infrared of the center of the Milky Way and each splotch represents a star. So this is real data. Each of these multicolor splotches is, are real data of stars in the center of the Milky Way. The star-shaped white thing in the center is not real data. It is uh, It's a bit confusing that it's also a star, but it's just meant to mark a certain position. And you will see why that position is special. Okay, And then on the top right is shown a counter, which is the date. So these data started in 1995, first with speckle imaging and then with this compensation uh, for the turbulence called adaptive optics. And so now I will show you an animation and you can see uh, the so-called proper motion, meaning how these stars are moving in the plane of the sky. So here you obviously see some curves which are not real data. They are just to guide the eye. And on top you can see the counter running and it is running, it is going to run all the way to 2020 uh, and then it will loop. So it's very striking uh, what is seen here. So first of all, Oh, sorry, I thought it was looping. I didn't set it to looping. I forgot that. I'll play it again. Uh, so, one thing you notice is that the stars are not moving in straight lines. Secondly, they are not moving randomly at all. They are all moving in what look like elliptical orbits. But more importantly, all these elliptical orbits have a common focus, and that focus is that white star. So this is now direct dynamical evidence for a black hole in the very center. As you notice, this star uh, called SO2, uh, it's a very famous star because uh, it has completed uh, more than one orbit, which was a very exciting thing. And uh, it passes extremely close to this position of this dark object, which is driving all of these things. And you can see that it emerges from that position. So it hasn't had a collision uh, and then deflected. It has gone on coasting through its elliptical orbit, which means that the size of this thing has to be much, much smaller than the distance of closest approach of this star. So that was the definitive conclusion that the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is four million times as heavy as our sun. The next direct evidence from black holes came from the very famous detection of gravitational waves. So there was this new observatory that was built uh, to detect the gravitational waves. And the way they detect them is by actually measuring ripples in our space time when uh, some mass uh, uh, moves. So ripples in space time happen all the time, but they are extremely, extremely uh, minute. And so we will never be able to measure them. But if you have two black holes that coalesce, the ripples in the space time are quite significant. They're still very minute by our measuring standards. And therefore, this observatory took a long time and a lot of innovativeness and so on to build, but nevertheless it got built and they actually detected gravitational waves and uh, they won the Nobel Prize as well. Uh, I highly recommend uh, the talk that Gabriela Gonzalez gave at the announcement discovery of this observatory LIGO, uh, which happened in 2015, it, where she described extremely beautifully uh, the physics behind, uh, first of all, what they found and the physics behind what they found. And this discovery uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2017. Uh, the, the prize was for the discovery of gravitational waves for the first time. However, this was also the uh, a second piece of direct evidence for black holes. Because 
uh, nothing else could possibly explain the ripples they measured. And the ripples they measured exactly coincided with the pred prediction of gender relativity for black holes. But that said, the question still remains, what is, what, how to really, really find a black hole? So uh, suppose you have a very uh, low mass, relatively low mass dark object, and some stuff approaches very close to it, it would be attracted by that gravitational force, and it would start swirling into it and get heated and therefore shine. And if it did that, then I'm saying this is a hy the hypothetical dark object, you would see the silhouette of this object against that light. However, if you had a black hole there instead of a low mass, uh, just ordinary dark object, then because of the curvature of space-time near the black hole, the, the silhouette would look very different. The silhouette would look like what Gargantua looked like in the film Interstellar. And that is because there is this mat, uh, stuff which is swirling around uh, the black hole and then eventually plunging into it. And because it is accelerated, it will be heated and then will shine. But the light from the stuff that is behind the black hole is bent over the black surface of the black hole and comes, becomes visible to us. So that is why you get this top hat like prediction. So this is a very, very strong prediction. However, it is something very difficult to discover because we don't have sharp enough images to, we didn't have, I should say, uh, sharp enough images to measure something like that, except uh, until the Event Horizon Telescope got built. So this is a telescope, which is actually an array of multiple telescopes spread across the planet. Uh, this is Katie Bowman, who spearheaded uh, the computer algorithms that were needed, very, very complex computer algorithms that were needed to reduce those data uh, from this array. Uh, and they uh, observed this galaxy called Messier 87. Uh, this is the galaxy. Uh, this is its visible light image. Uh, this is a field, these are some foreground stars, and you see lots of galaxies in there, but this is Messier 87. Uh, that's a close-up of it. And this is what the Event Horizon Telescope saw when they observed it in 2017. So what they saw at a frequency of about a millimeter is exactly what uh, uh, is predicted by general theory of relativity, exactly what Gargantua shows, namely the silhouette of a dark object. So, so then, that is really, really evidence, the most direct evidence for a black hole. And uh, this is to give you the big picture. So Messi 87 uh, also squirts out bipolar radio jets and they go out into inter intergalactic space and form this huge uh, sort of uh, cocoon of plasma emission. And if you take the central part and zoom in a million times, that is when uh, you see this uh, silhouette of the central black hole. So I want to go back to uh, the uh, Andrea Yez and Reinhard Genzel discovery and Roger Penrose. As you know, all three of them won the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, Roger Penrose for his uh, uh, discovery that gravitational collapse of the kind that Schwarzschild uh, predicted was inevitable, and Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel for actually finding direct evidence for the first time for black holes. Uh, so Andrea Gez, uh, is a woman, and somehow the headlines for the Nobel Prize in Physics got bigger because a woman got the prize. Now, why should that be? Well, uh, I recommend that you read this uh, opinion piece that the director of the Keck Observatory, Hilton Lewis, wrote. Um, it's a very interesting piece, and he says, uh, how Andrea Gaze won the Nobel for an experiment nobody thought would work. She insisted on doing it anyway. And Andrea Gez herself has said that I grew up hearing the word no all the time. You're a girl, you can't do it. 
you're a girl, there's no way you can get into MIT. There is no way you can get into Caltech. And so it isn't surprising that when Andrea Ghez uh, finished her PhD thesis in Caltech uh, and she mastered the technique of spectral imaging, she actually uh, dedicated uh, her thesis to all the women scientists she said, I have known. Now, this is a bit of an issue. Uh, all of you perhaps know that there are many, many uh, women who have done extraordinary transformational science in physics and also in other fields, but have not got the Nobel Prize. Marie Curie got the Nobel Prize in 1903, but only after protest, despite the fact that her science was awarded the Nobel Prize. The next woman to receive the Nobel Prize was Maria Gapit Mia in 1963. And then there was a huge gap until in 2018, finally Donna, Donald Strickland uh, got the Nobel Prize in physics. So this is, uh, there's an important point here. So it is true that women need to be encouraged um, uh, to do physics like anyone else, but it is what is required of us is more than that. We all, regardless of whether we are men or women and what institute we work in, need to be concerned as to why, why is it that women need this extra encouragement? In other words, why is it that women face extra discouragement, like Andrea Gates said. And so then it becomes an obligation and responsibility to look at all our processes, whether it is our institutions or even an organization like SEDS. So uh, it is important that an organization like SEDS or BAS looks at its composition, for example, and ask the question, why is it that there is a, a skewed representation of people in it? Uh, and not put all the blame on outside society or parents don't encourage because the kind of negative reaction that Andrea gets, for example, it was nothing to do with parents and family and society. The kind of pushback or uh, not, uh, lack of acknowledgement that Marie Curie faced was not to do with uh, lack of encouragement. She was already doing fantastic science and that fantastic science got the Nobel Prize. Similarly, Jocelyn Bell did fa fantastic science, that science got the Nobel Prize, but she did not get the Nobel Prize. So one needs to ask the question in a different way as to what are the systemic barriers to, uh, uh, to having a uniform representation rather than such a skewed representation in all spheres uh, that we uh, uh, work in, whether it is amateur astronomy or physics uh, proper or physics uh, teaching or a physics classroom, whatever it is. So... Coming back to the black hole, the evidence, the direct evidence that came was for a giant black hole in the center of the Milky Way. But those are not the only kind of black holes that are there in the Milky Way, indeed in any galaxy. Uh, I sort of in passing mentioned that stars can collapse into black holes and such black holes are scattered all over the Milky Way. I did not dwell on them because that's a whole story uh, in its own right. But uh, we have direct evidence now for about 60 odd black holes and counting. And this uh, this is a thing called Black Cat, which uh, is maintained by a bunch of astrophysicists who continuously update it whenever a new such black hole is discovered. And estimates are that there are about 10 million such black holes scattered throughout the Milky Way. But these are stellar mass black holes. Um, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, such black holes, it turns out, and maybe not so surprisingly, they are in the center of every galaxy we've looked at. So Andromeda Galaxy has a giant black hole in the center of the Milky Way, so does Messi 81, so does every other galaxy that has been looked at. And uh, astrophysicists called in the Bell were, uh, had proposed this a long time ago, I think I mentioned that, and so uh, his idea has been fully vindicated. But not only that, what has been found is that the bigger the bulge of the galaxy, the bigger is the giant black hole in the center. Um, this was uh, investigated very extensively by astrophysicist Laura Ferrarite, 
And this is a sort of pictorial plot of that. These are the real data that show that. Uh, and the point is that this kind of a correlation cannot be explained by gravitation. Because if you take, for example, the Andromeda galaxy, the central giant black hole is so, so tiny, actually. It may be a giant black hole, but in the, on the scale of the galaxy, it's really, really tiny. It is smaller than the smallest spot you can imagine on this image. So then it cannot influence uh, what is the mass in the whole galaxy, meaning the stars forming, forming in the whole galaxy. And so I will leave you with this very tantalizing idea that what this means is that the giant black hole in the center must be interacting with the galaxy through some other mechanism. And the mechanism we think is this business of matter swirling into the black hole, in the process shining, in the process emitting a lot of radiation, and thereby creating these bipolar jets, and thereby interacting with the near neighborhood where stars are forming. So there is a sort of a feedback between the uh, processes around the giant black hole in the center and the star forming uh, processes outside. And uh, this kind of squirting out of bipolar jets go all the way, as I showed earlier, into intergalactic space, making cavities even in the very tenuous gas of the intergalactic uh, medium. So I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Am I supposed to look at some chat or something? I don't know how to... Oh, I see. Here is the chat button. Participants can unmute and ask questions. We also have a question uh, from chat, ma'am. Uh, I will read it out. Okay. So, uh, uh, it's a little slow. I can't, I'm not able to see all the chat questions, but it seems to be loading. So, hopefully, I'll see them. But it'll be good if you uh, read out the questions. Yeah, uh, I'll read out the questions. Uh, so, yeah. So, in infrared and X ray images, uh, the redder part uh, represents higher temperature and bluer part represents cooler region. Uh, uh, what those red and uh, blue uh, will represent on radio image? That was the question asked. Uh, okay, so this is about which image? Uh, it's asked about uh, the red and blue regions in the radio uh, image. Radio spectrum. Radio image, yeah, but I want to know which image because you see, I what I explained is that uh, any image that is taken in non-visible light, whether it is X-rays or radio or infrared or ultraviolet, which human eye cannot see, we represent them as false color images, and there the colors are false. They don't. Uh, they own, so they what they represent is arbitrary, and it depends on who is creating the image, and they are fancy. So that's why I said that the uh, false color images has to be accompanied by a key, uh, which dis, which explains which color is what intensity. So uh, I want to know in order to answer this particular question, I want to know which image they are talking about. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Lohit. I'm from uh, Coimbatore. So I have a uh, I have a doubt. So uh, so uh, I was uh, you were uh, earlier telling that uh, quasars were uh, uh, like showing redshift, but uh, how did they detect the redshift? They need a nearby sample to detect that uh, redshift, right? Uh, yeah. So that's a very good question. Uh, so the way you uh, measure the shift is that you have to first recognize the line. So uh, we have studied, uh, you know, gases, atoms in the laboratory on Earth. And so we know uh, the lines that each element emits. So, for example, hydrogen uh, has, I don't know if you studied the spectrum of hydrogen, but there is something called the Bama spectrum and then the Bama lines and the, you know, in the infrared, there are the bracket lines and so on. 
uh, for other elements like oxygen or uh, if you've done an undergrad you might have done uh, if you've done an undergraduate in physics you might have done the sodium uh, double slit experiment uh, the sodium uh, line uh, experiments where you have a gas where you see the sodium doublet mm. so each element has its characteristic emission line uh, it will of course depend on the temperature to which uh, that element is heated but uh, but nevertheless each element has its very very definite pattern of emission lines that very very precisely known frequency now uh, if you uh, now go to the sky uh, and take a spectrum if you see only one emission line then of course you cannot conclude anything because that could be anything uh, it could be from any element at any temperature whatever but if you see multiple lines of course they won't be at the frequencies uh, no no emission line will be at the frequency that you measure in the laboratory because i mean no astrophysical object is still you know all of them are moving uh, in the line of sight and so there will be some uh, shift apart from the shift due to the universe itself expanding so that's a dif different shift so one is cosmological shift and cosmological is due to stretching of space and always a red shift whereas there is also doppler shift which is due to the movement of the galaxies in the line of sight and that could be either a blue shift if it's moving towards us or a red shift is moving away from us so what you actually observe is a combination of these two things now uh, so if you have one line you can't say anything if you have if you see two lines then there is some hope if you see a lot of lines then there is more hope because you will be able to identify the pattern rather than the frequency and once you identify the pattern saying ah this is this combination of the uh, h beta line and the oxygen uh, double ionized oxygen doublet that sort of thing so once you've identified the pattern then it's easy for you to sort of uh, you know move it around and see um, so you know the 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 uh, frequency of emission from the laboratory and if you see a shift you will see a systematic shift in all the lines and so from that systematic shift you measure the uh, red shift or blue shift or combination as it so was that clear Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Uh, I have two questions, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, one is, um, you had said that micro black holes cannot be observed, no, ma'am? I didn't say they cannot be observed. I said they have not been observed so far. Uh, because uh, Hawking radiation is more predominant for smaller black holes. So yes. by that, you could have observed, no, ma'am? Well, first of all, uh, Hawking radiation is a theoretical uh, idea. It has not been, uh, there's been no experimental evidence for it. Uh, and uh, uh, it is true that uh, small black holes are expected, predicted uh, to uh, show uh, Hawking radiation. But uh, also, very, very small black holes would emit all the Hawking radiation and disappear. So their lifetimes are also very short. So the chances of observing, so there have to be a lot of them if we have to see them. And so far, we have no evidence. And I didn't say we can't observe. I just said we have not observed. So we have not observed micro black holes and we have not observed any Hawking radiation, whether from micro black holes or any other kind of black holes. And also, like, uh, is it true that non-rotating black holes emit more energy than rotating black holes? No, that's not true. I mean, we have no evidence for that. Oh, okay. As in, uh, there are complications. Okay. If, you know, if you get into this whole uh, uh, the complexity of these kind of, we call them accreting uh, supermassive black holes. So supermassive black holes are those with masses more than a million times the mass of the sun. And accreting are those which are which have matter which has landed up in their very close vicinity and is swirling around it and eventually go to plunge into it. So if you look at such accreting uh, supermassive black holes, they show a whole range of properties. And some of those properties, there is an idea that some of those properties could be explained by the rotating versus non-rotating black holes, but it's complicated. It's not a simple thing that 
uh, non-rotating ones don't emit and rotating ones do or vice versa. It's not something so simple. Um, ever since uh, uh, my many black holes were found uh, throughout the uh, throughout our galaxy, uh, P, uh, we have included it in uh, a candidate for dark matter. But uh, why aren't they as much uh, like uh, in the first place than the other uh, uh, like um, more probable uh, uh, things like neutrinos or other uh, new particles? Like um, so. I, okay, I don't think I answered your question. So it is true that black holes have not uh, have not been uh, have not uh, confirmed. I mean, are not a confirmed dark matter candidate. Mm, but uh, what was the rest of your question? I didn't quite get it. Ma'am, uh, the thing is that I'm asking why they are not as popular as other uh, candidates like new particles or uh, neutrinos for the candidates, the dark matter. So oh, why are not popular candidates for dark matter? Yeah, uh, they are not that very popular as the others. That's the, re that's the question. Because uh, they haven't uh, satisfied the requirements. So you, you would need, so every galaxy has dark matter, right? And uh, the dark matter has certain properties in that uh, it, it interacts only gravitationally and, and so on. So um, black holes, on the other hand, uh, yeah, so in principle, they could be dark matter. But the, if, if they were, then they would exhibit certain distribution properties and so on, which they don't. Thank you, man. Okay, now I'm seeing this very first question that was asked about false color pictures by Adarsh. Uh, and I'm uh, now I see this question about it also contains a red and a blue. Uh, contrast in its image, what does those colors signify? So I think I answered it. So the answer is that in a false colored image, uh, the colors don't, the colors are completely arbitrary. The colors are decided by whoever did the rendering. And uh, so they have to be interpreted by looking at the accompanying key. So each, there is no specific thing that blue is uh, higher temperature or anything like that. In a false color picture, there isn't. In real stars, yes, there is, but not in false color pictures. So there is something for crab nebula. I don't know what that. Uh... Okay. Um, so there's something. Uh, yes, Lima, Bama, Pastion, Bracket, Fund. Um, I guess that's not a question. Okay. Uh, is it possible to enter black hole using Otto von Gurki's hemisphere theory? I'm sorry, I don't know what that theory is. Um, so anyway, uh, the question is, I, I, I don't quite understand the question because uh, you can't enter something with a theory, right? You want to enter something, it has to be practical. Um, so uh, whether this, this particular theory predicts that one can enter a black hole, I don't know. Um, as far as I know, my understanding is that the current understanding is that we don't know what happens inside a black hole. Uh, and uh, Roger Penrose showed that once you enter a black hole, you know, all those light cones, they point towards. So you are only uh, going to the future. Uh, you know, there's no turning back. And uh, so that much uh, is what is predicted. But um, more than that, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't, and I don't know th that particular theory. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Will our sun become a black hole in the future? Uh, no. Uh, as per our understanding of stellar evolution theory, 
Uh, remember, I, I mentioned uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar's work, uh, where he showed that when a star about as massive as our sun uh, is, uh, you know, expends all its fuel and there's nothing left to hold it up, it starts to collapse. It will collapse, but not all the way, because the uh, electron degeneracy pressure, which is a pressure uh, predicted by Pauli's exclusion principle, it's a quantum mechanical effect. Uh, because of that, the star cannot squeeze itself uh, right to a singularity, and that degeneracy pressure will hold it up. But if a star is more massive than that, uh, 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 so uh, then it will um, become a neutron star, and only if it's even more massive, it will become black. So our sun is predicted to become this so-called white dwarf, which is the star which is held up by its degeneracy pressure, this quantum mechanical pressure. Um, is there a universal code for false coloring? No, uh, there isn't. As I said, it's very arbitrary. And I, in fact, showed you a couple of different uh, uh, in false colored images of the same data set, right? So, no, there is no uh, universal. Uh, can you share your ideas about the black hole information paradox? No, that's a very complicated topic. And uh, I'm not even the expert on it. So, I think... Uh, uh, I think you would know as much as I do. Uh, you can read it up. I, I wouldn't be able to give you any big insights into that. Um, how is string theory and black holes connect to each other? Again, I'm not a string theorist, and I don't know. Uh, I, I cannot answer that question. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? I think we have uh, no more questions, ma'am. Uh, yeah. How do gravitational wave uh, carry energy away from the black hole if nothing can escape a black hole? Yeah, so uh, see, it's really important to understand that uh, all the energy and power that we get, uh, we might loosely say from a black hole. But by that, we don't mean that it is coming from the inside of a black hole. So even gravitational waves, uh, they arise because of the curvature of space-time caused by a black hole. So it's outside the black hole. So if you have a mass, uh, whether a black hole or a water bottle or whatever, if you have a mass in space-time, the space-time around it will curve. And the heavier this object, that is the more massive this object, the Heavier is the curvature, the larger is the curvature, the sharper is the curvature. So uh, when you have two black holes coalescing, what is happening is that both of them have this curved uh, space-time around it and they are moving and they are going to spiral uh, into each other. So this space-time, uh, they create ripples in the space-time. And it is those ripples that we call gravitational waves, and those are what are detected by the gravitational wave observatory. So these are not coming from inside of the black hole. They are coming from the ripples in the space-time around the black hole, which is created by uh, these uh, black holes moving. Uh, Black holes emit, um, okay, I guess that's not really, really a question. So is that it? Uh, it, um, it seems there are no more questions. Okay. Uh, I have one last question. Okay. Um, uh, the the gravitational waves are said to not be uh, interfered by anything else. Like uh, if they are uh, coming uh, towards Earth, uh, the objects in between the source and the Earth uh, won't affect the, uh, the gravitational waves so much. That is the uh, same. But however, uh, the uh, like disturbances the gravitational waves ca cause to the objects in between the source and the Earth can uh, uh, themselves emit gravitational waves and uh, uh, interfere with our uh, signal, right? Yeah, well, the, yes, that's true. Uh, because, you know, every every object uh, 
uh, if it uh, jump, if I start jumping around, uh, you know, I will create ripples in space time. But um, it's a question of the magnitude of it. So those those are extremely extremely uh, small uh, ripples um, uh, compared to the ripples that a very very massive thing. Uh, like the sun or in this case black holes can create so remember that we are in the very very initial stages of gravitational wave detection but the kind of detection they have made are of extremely minute uh, signals in fact uh, when um, they announced their first discovery in 2015 that was one of that was touted as one of the uh, finest measurements ever made